and verses 31 to 35. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go tell that fox. I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the gospel of our Lord is also the basis of the message this morning. When you choose to become a follower of Jesus Christ, you begin the great adventure for which you were created in the first place. The thing about adventures is this. They never come without a certain amount of discomfort, risk, and even danger. I mean, you can have some canned adventures, I suppose, without those things. Many, many people will stand in long lines at Disneyland to have an adventure, riding on a little car that takes them through one or another of the various uh, things that have been set up for your entertainment. But we all know that those are kind of pre-packaged adventures. Real adventures typically have some element of danger, or at least discomfort. <laughs> right? Isn't it true? When you read a book about somebody's adventure, there is always a part of it where they encountered real challenges and difficulties, hurts, disappointments, and then overcame great obstacles. You know, it's like that in the adventure of life for those who follow Jesus. I came across a story that I thought illustrates how this sometimes happens. Now, this has to do with a battle that took place, and I don't want you to say that we should be involved in this kind of earthly battle, but it illustrates the truth. It happened during a battle in the American Civil War. One of his officers came to General Longstreet to say that he could not obey Longstreet's order to move his men up to the line of battle. Longstreet responded with sarcasm. This is what he said. He said, very well, never mind. Just let them stay where they are, and the enemy will advance, and that will spare you the trouble. The truth is that every follower of Jesus will have to face spiritual battles. And if we are unwilling to engage, the battle will come to us. You may remember that our Lord and Master faced danger and opposition. Why should we be surprised when it happens to those who follow him as well? In Luke chapter 13, we find a most interesting incident. This one that we just read together. There is a bit of a surprise in this passage in that we find out that not all of the Pharisees were hostile to Jesus. Typically in the stories of the Bible, the Pharisees don't come off looking very well, do they? They were often on the wrong side of the issue, in opposition to Jesus. And some of the harshest words that Jesus ever spoke were directed to them. Now, it wasn't their teaching so much. The teachings of Jesus were frequently in general agreement with the things that the Pharisees claimed to believe. The problem was that their attitudes and their actions did not match what they claimed to believe. They were 
In other words, often hypocrites. But uh, they weren't all bad. Among them were those who were true lovers of God. You may remember that Nicodemus, for example, was a Pharisee. He started off as a secret follower of Jesus, but ultimately came out into the open and was actually involved in the burial of Jesus after his crucifixion. Here we have a passage, one of those rare passages, in which some of the Pharisees are actually trying to help Jesus. According to Luke chapter 13 and verse 31, at that time some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, leave this place and go somewhere else, Herod wants to kill you. Now at this time Herod Antipas is the king of Galilee, the northern province of Israel where Jesus was doing most of his work. And Herod didn't like it. Now, this was not an idle warning that the Pharisees brought to Jesus. The Herod family had been an enemy of Jesus from the time of his birth. It was one of the members of this family, Herod the Great, who, you may remember, attempted to kill the baby Jesus. When the wise men came and said, where is he who was born king of the Jews? We've seen his star. We've come to worship him. What did that Herod do? When he realized that the wise men were not going to tip him off to the birth of the king, he ordered that all of the baby boys under the age of two in the area of Bethlehem were to be slaughtered. The slaughter of the innocents. This is one of his relatives now, Herod Antipas, who wants to kill Jesus. And what is Jesus' response? Well, according to Luke chapter 13 and verse 32, Jesus said, Go tell that fox. I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I'll reach my goal. Now, as William Barclay points out in his commentary, it takes a brave man to call the reigning king a fox. For the Jews, calling someone a fox was definitely not a compliment. The fox was a symbol of three things. Number one, they regarded the fox as the slyest of all animals. In other words, the fox was sneaky. Secondly, the fox was considered to be the most destructive of all animals. You know, there's a verse in the Bible that says, Beware the little foxes that spoil the vine. Foxes, young foxes especially, love to get into the, the grape uh, vineyards and pull all the young grapes off of the vines just for, well, I guess just for fun. But uh, like some of the fun that other young people have, it was pretty destructive. And the third thing about the fox was that they regarded it as a symbol of a worthless and insignificant person. So when Jesus said, you go tell that fox, um, that was not likely to make Herod any less inclined to kill him. I heard about a preacher by the name of Latimer who had the opportunity to speak in Westminster Abbey. And King Henry, at that time, was present in the congregation. Of course, that was somewhat intimidating. And when Latimer stood in the pulpit, he said, as if speaking to himself, Latimer, 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 be careful what you say. The King of England is here. And then he paused and he said, Latimer, 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 be careful what you say. The King of Kings is here. And we need to remember that the King of Kings is here. Jesus was always obedient to his heavenly Father. How often do we change our words or our behavior because we are afraid of what people might say or what they might do to us if we offend them with the truth? Jesus took his orders from his Father God, and he would not shorten his work by even one day to please or to escape an earthly king. We read earlier in the service about the prophet Jeremiah, who was threatened with death 
for speaking God's <coughs> truth. But he would not back down, and he would not give in, and he refused to change the message that God had given him. Nor did he attempt to run away. Listen again, Jeremiah chapter 26, and we'll pick it up in verse 20. Here we read, Actually, let's go back a little further. Verse 12, initially. Then Jeremiah said to all the officials and all the people, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and this city all the things you have heard. Now reform your ways and your actions and obey the Lord your God. Then the Lord will relent and not bring the disaster he has pronounced against you. He didn't back down. In fact, he went on to say, as for me, I'm in your hands. Do with me whatever you think is good and right. Be assured, however, that if you put me to death, you will bring the guilt of innocent blood on yourselves and on this city. At the time of Jeremiah, there were a lot of false prophets. The next chapter goes on to tell us about one by the name of Hananiah, who just made up prophecies, told the people what they wanted to hear. But there were... Also, at least one more prophet who spoke the truth, in addition to Jeremiah. A man by the name of Uriah. And his story is told, we didn't read this earlier, but it's told a little bit later, beginning with verse 20. It says, now Uriah was another man who prophesied in the name of the Lord. He prophesied the same thing as Jeremiah did. I want you to notice. He started out, <coughs> same story, same message from God, right? When King Jehoiakim and all his officers and officials heard his words, the king was determined to put him to death. But Uriah heard of it and fled in fear to Egypt. Now I want you to contrast that with Jeremiah, who stood in and said, kill me if you must but you'll be putting an innocent man to death, and you'll be guilty for it. <coughs> Uriah fled in fear to Egypt. King Jehoiakim, however, sent men. They brought Uriah out of Egypt. They took him to King Jehoiakim, who had him struck down with a sword, and his body was thrown into the burial place of the common people. The point is this. Running away does not guarantee safety, does it? What we need to do in any circumstance is to put ourselves in God's hands and trust Him to protect us, if that's where He's called us to be. The Bible says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified, for the Lord your God goes with you. That's Deuteronomy 31, and verse 6. Jesus said, in His most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 11. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus doesn't expect that you will never feel afraid but he does tell us that we are not to let fear control us. Allow him to take charge. Don't be terrified. Do the right thing regardless. In Luke chapter 13 and verse 33, as the passage goes on, we find out that uh, Jesus knows what lies ahead for him. He says, in any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. Jesus already knew where he was going to die. Even though he knew that it was the place where he would be killed, just as they had killed the prophets before him, Jesus had a very special love for Jerusalem. And he still does. Jesus had repeatedly offered his love 
only to have it spurned. It hurts to give your love to someone, only to have it rejected and betrayed. It is a tragedy to give your heart, only to have it broken. But that is what happened with Jesus. According to verse 34, Jesus lamented, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Psalm 91 verse 1 says, Those who live under the protection of the Most High will dwell in the shadow of the Almighty. There is that covering <clears throat> protection of God available in all circumstances. In the early pioneer days here on the prairies, there was great danger from prairie fires. Driven by strong winds, fire could sweep across the prairies, destroying everything in its path. I heard the story of a prairie fire that swept across one of those pioneer farmsteads. And uh, the people were able to escape, but the things that were left behind that they had to flee from uh, were completely destroyed by the fire. When they came back, they found that uh, one of their uh, chickens, their hens, uh, was, was laying on the ground, completely charred and dead, as the fire had swept over. When they picked up that burnt chick, that chicken, they found that the baby chicks underneath the wings had survived the fire. They had been kept safe. She died. They lived. Jesus died so that we could live. His death was the greatest act of love in all of history. Jesus, who died and rose again, offered his love to all, and he still offers his love to all. But sadly, not all are willing to receive it. Jesus' invitation is inspired by love, but it also comes with a warning. Those who reject his loving invitation will ultimately have to face his wrath and judgment. But that is not what God wants for you. He wants you to respond to his love and love him in return. And then when you do, you begin the great adventure which is your destiny. Today, I want to encourage you, invite you, do everything in my power to persuade you. But I know I can't do anything about it. Only the Holy Spirit of God can reach into your heart and inspire you to make a decision to follow Jesus. Decide today to follow Jesus. If you sense the Holy Spirit working in your heart and mind this morning, at whatever point you may be in your spiritual journey, make the decision that you <coughs> follow Jesus. At any cost, and regardless of the opposition. When you do that, when you decide to follow Jesus, even in the face of opposition and ridicule, you will experience a life of joy and a life of purpose from this day forward. Until we go to be with him or until he returns for us, let's follow Jesus. One day, we will join in praise with all of God's people of all the ages, from all over the world, as we shout the victory. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let's pray.
Father God, we are in your presence now. Your Holy Spirit is here, the Spirit of Jesus. As you speak to us in a very personal way in our minds and in our hearts, help us to make the choice, the decision, the commitment to follow Jesus no matter what the cost. We confess our sin. We confess that we have sinned against you in our thoughts and words and actions, by things we have done, by things we have not done. And we ask that for the sake of your Son, Jesus, that you would forgive us. <coughs> we commit our lives to you. We believe you died for us, Jesus. We believe that you came back to life again. And we know that you offer life to us as well. Not only a life that's full and abundant here, a life of adventure as we live with you, but a life that is eternal, that will last forever in your presence. How good it will be to be with you forever. So God, we surrender. We just want to give up our own way today. We want to live life your way. We want to follow you. Right now, this moment, all day long, for the rest of our lives, and on into eternity.